It was the afternoon of January 13, 2006. The police were alerted about an ongoing bank robbery in the San Sidero suburb of Buenos Aires, the capital of Argentina. Upon arriving at the branch of Banco Rio, one of Argentina's major financial institutions, the officers were relieved to find that the robbers were still inside. Outside, the streets were swarming with police. Police set the perimeters. There were five thieves in the bank, costumed in various disguises, and now they were trapped along with 23 hostages. Police soon successfully established radio contact with the robbers and negotiations started, which went on for a couple of hours until robbers went silent. Police waited for some more long and then broke in. But when they entered, thieves were nowhere. Despite the perimeter setup and bank being completely surrounded, robbers had vanished into thin air like they were never there in the first place. The story is said to have started with Fernando Araujo as a central figure and it started two years prior to the day of robbery. Araujo conceived the idea of robbing a bank and shared it with his friend Sebastian Garcia Bolster, who was repairman for engines and a longtime friend of Araujo. He was the kind of guy who would make machines out of kitchen utensils, but he was a law-abiding man. Bolster didn't take the bank robbery plan seriously when Araujo first mentioned it thinking it was just a crazy idea influenced by Araujo's excessive marijuana use. But Araujo returned with a more detailed plan and Bolster agreed on the condition that there would be no violence involved. Now Araujo had his engineer in the form of Bolster. Araujo had already come up with a bold and intricate plan to enter and exit the bank using a tunnel. That area was filled with multiple tunnels which ran city water to the ocean. He just had to find the right one. Even if they entered through tunnel, the biggest problem at hand was how they would disable alarm systems in the night. The only feasible solution they reached was to carry out the robbery during business hours when the alarm systems were not active. Arahu explained that they would create a distraction by staging a fake bank robbery, a classic smash and grab. This way, while everyone was focused on the fake bank robbery, they would quietly enter from tunnel steal from the boxes in basement and leave together. Poster was the engineer who would do the tunnel work, but it wasn't a two-people job. He recruited a veteran bank robber known as Doc and an old associate of Doc named Ruben Alberto de la Torre, nicknamed Beto. Both Doc and Beto were former members of Underworld and were very active robbers during 1980s and 1990s. To point their growing scheme, Arahu sold his car and invested $5,000, but that money didn't last long. They needed an investor and Doc knew just the person. A well-known Uruguayan thief named Luis Mario Vitez Seans. In the 1990s and 2000s, he used to climb buildings to rob apartments until he was caught. He had been living comfortably, but the prospect of participating in such a daring plan was too tempting for him to resist. He invested around $100,000 and became an integral part of the team. Problems came and they were fixed. Bolster was to duck the tunnel upward from underground canal. But what if estimate goes wrong and they end up in old guy's home instead of bank basement? The answer was of course math. Bolster first measured the circumference of his bike tire and then rode it from manhole in the street to the wall of the bank. Using trigonometric equations, they had the measurements required for digging. Another problem they faced was how they would break the boxes. Arahu went out to another branch of same bank, rented the box and made note of the brand. Then they ordered few and practiced on those. They concurred on the solution that they would break it with jackhammer as cutting and explosives could be dangerous. On the day of the robbery, the seven men went about their regular morning routines before preparing for the big play. Gang members met for the coffee at a bar where they applied glue to their fingers to avoid leaving prints. From there, they set out in three vehicles. Two cars went to the bank and the getaway van reached a pickup spot. Bolster, as usual, worked alone. First in the bank was Beto in a lab coat, followed by Doc, who wore a ski mask. Beto pulled out a toy gun and swung it around and told everyone, This is a robbery. Get on the floor. 
Meanwhile, with it and another last minute addition whose identity is still a mystery, drove car into the garage under Ben. They shut the garage door, barricaded it with the car and joined the act of robbery upstairs. Arahu came in separately in another stolen car, which was filled with nails and oil cans and left its flasher on to give the impression that it was getaway car for robbers. Arahu had disguised himself with blonde wig, ski mask and a baseball cap so well, when he entered a bank, Doc pulled a toy gun on him until Arahu said, Peto, it's me. Arahu had assigned specific roles to the robbery team. With that, dealt with the police and introduced himself as Walter, last minute addition who also had the name Luis and Beto controlled the hostages and Doc activated Bolster in the basement. The engineer waited at the end of the tunnel he had dug separated from the basement by a thin wall. Doc broke through the wall from inside and greeted him. Robbery was on. Police were everywhere outside. The group had disarmed the guard and sent him outside. After 10 minutes, they released a nervous young man followed by a woman after some time. This was a ploy to make it seem like they were making progress with the police and to project a nervous appearance. During the robbery at one point, police overheard Walter and another robber singing happy birthday to a bank employee whose phone was receiving birthday messages. After some time, Arahu signaled with that who instructed the police negotiator to order six pizzas. With that, then warned the hostages that anyone who moved would be killed and that the gang needed to step away for a meeting. Then they all came down to the basement where Bolster worked fast. Once they had what they came for, Bolster lowered the tools and loot to Luis in the tunnel and then scrambled fake bombs in entrance. Beto and Vitet had already gone into the tunnel. Arahu and Doc were left. One of them sprayed bleach to destroy any DNA evidence, while the other scattered hair from a barber shop to confuse investigators. Finally, they entered the tunnel moving a cupboard in front of the tunnel hole. To anyone who entered, the room would appear to be an empty, untouched storage space. Not everything went into their direction. Motor of the inflatable boat wouldn't start when they got in. Arahu had planned and stored pedals for such an event too. He handed out pedals. The robbers fled from the bank and traveled 10 blocks to reach a passage where they discarded their boat and climbed a ladder to a side channel that led to their getaway van. They used a pulley system to hoist the bags of stolen goods, then escaped without any evidence. Above, police brought pizzas, but the connection was lost. After having waited for some more hours, police raided the bank, but to their surprise, there was no one. But few toy guns arranged in an order and a note which said, in a neighborhood of rich people, without weapons or crutches, it's just money, not love. The thieves had broken 143 out of 400 boxes. Cops searched everywhere, but thieves were seeing the raid live from their TVs. Argentine news reports stated that the thieves who embarrassed the police on national television stole nearly $20 million in cash and valuables. In the weeks that followed, media and newspapers glamorized the robbers and the heist, but it all came undone due to the one mistake no one, even the thieves, couldn't have predicted. The wife of Beto blew it all. She wasn't part of the heist, but she sure had an idea of the shenanigans of the group. Beto had a girlfriend who he was cheating with on his wife. He had been unfaithful to his wife earlier, but this particular time, his wife perhaps had it enough. She went to the police and told them everything. What happened between both is not fully known, but from the accounts we know, Beto brought home his share making no secret of the origin of that loot. Beto claims that later, when he moved some of that loot, he discovered that a sizable portion was missing. The couple fought over it. This is what started the fight. Police already had the suspicions about the members of the group, and wife of Beto was able to identify them. They had worked in the garage of Beto, so she had seen them. Doc and Luis, who had never come to the house, weren't on the police's radar and were never charged with the crime. They all served their term, which wasn't more than a couple of years. Bolster served shortest, only 25 months, as he was thought to assist only in digging tunnel. Cops were able to recover only a small fraction of what was stolen. Where is the rest? Beto says, you know, when they arrested me, I got a big knock on my head. I can't remember. 
we hope you enjoyed this now don't forget to like and subscribe for more animated documentaries